proposal. All right, as uh, <laughs> Joe said, I was an alum here. I played baseball here. And one of the things that Joe asked me to talk about was kind of my path to my current job. Um, one of the neatest things about going to Whitewater or wherever you go is everybody's going to have a unique story. You're obviously all here, but how you got here is going to be a little bit different. So my story, I always awesome. play baseball. Came to school here. Um, Jim Miller recruited me, who was still in the athletic department. Um, and I always want to be in the elementary education. But my goal was to be a fifth or a sixth grade teacher. I thought that was going to be my career path. Um, I love working with kids. Like a lot of all of you, you want to be a high school coach, whether that's football, baseball, basketball, whatever it is. That was going to be my path. I was going to play baseball here for four years. Get done with my eligibility. Moved to Milwaukee, Madison. Get a job over there and start coaching uh, high school baseball or, or soccer, whatever that I chose. Well, I was fortunate enough to play four years of professional baseball, so I got signed by the Giants out of, out of college. So that kind of put a little bit of a damper on my immediate plans. So played baseball for a couple years with the Giants, got released, picked up by the Twins. And by then, baseball was basically in my blood. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a college coach or else a professional coach. So when I got done, I got released. I talked to Coach Boldenlich, who was the current <coughs> coach here. And I said, what do I got to do? I played at a pretty high level. The last thing I want to do is coach high school baseball. Um, not sure if you guys have seen high school baseball lately, but it's pretty bad. And I wanted to say, you know what, I want to coach at Whitewater, the lowest and possibly a Division I program. And I figure with my professional experience, I'm just as capable as the next guy. So Coach Bo found me a job on campus, and he said, you got to get your master's. Whatever you want to do, you got to get your master's. Very few coaches. Unless you're, you know, the coach at Texas for football or wherever else, they're going to let you get through without a master's. So I started my master's in education, and that was going to open my open up some doors for being a college coach. About four years later, I three years later, I'm still doing it, and I don't know if any of you are college athletes, but the amount of time that you put into that sport is pretty crazy. The beauty of high school is that it's about a two-month season. You go to practice at 3.30, you're done at 6. You might have one or two games a week, and it's, it's over. College, especially college baseball, you're practicing in the fall for about four weeks, five weeks, until 8, 9 o'clock at night. You have winter camps, you have Thanksgiving camps, you have spring camps, and you get going back in the spring. Then your life is basically over starting February 1st till June 1st until the World Series is over. So eventually, I kind of had to turn off, change of heart, and I said, you know what? I don't want to do this. Well. Fortunately for me, my advisor for my master's program was the director over in the advising center. How many of you are freshmen or sophomores? Freshmen, any freshmen here? Upperclassmen? All of you probably had an advisor in the advising center over there. That was my first job. So I quit coaching baseball, was living in Milwaukee, having a good time, making a little bit of money, and I was pretty happy. I got my weekends off, my nights were off, and I was able to actually uh, kind of hang out with some friends and do what I wanted to do. But the beauty of it is, and the reason I'm telling you this, is that I have a master's. The reason I was able to get that, advice, that job in the advising center is that I needed a master's. For all of you that want to work in higher education, whether it's you know, advising or anything else, you have to have a master's degree no matter what it is. And now I didn't really know that when I went in, but having been around higher education for going on nine years, that's probably the most important piece, is that master's degree. So I was in the advising center for about five years, and while I was there, my supervisor, my boss, said, if anything comes up, take it. If there's a responsibility, take it. How many of you are business majors? A couple of you. One of the best advice, pieces of advice that I got was from a successful salesman, and he's lived in Kansas City, St. Louis, LA, Colorado, Philly, and now he's finally getting back to the Midwest to kind of enjoy his retirement. And he told me a long time ago, he said, if anybody tells you something that you can take advantage of, if it's for business, if they say, you know what, I want you to transfer over to Oregon, you say, when can I go? If they want you to go to some place in South Dakota, when can I go? And that's kind of what my mentality was when I was in the advising center. Whenever there's an opportunity for me to do something more above and beyond, whether it was for pay or just, you know, a different part of my job, I took it. And I encourage all of you to do that while you're whatever you're pursuing career you are, you want to pursue, whenever something comes up, it might be a pain in the ass, you might not want to do it, it might be weekends, it might be nights, take advantage of it, because in the long run, there's going to be people that notice that you were there 
that you said, you know what, I'll do it, whatever it is. I'll move to South Dakota, I'll move to Iowa. Sorry if you're from Iowa. Um, wherever it is, I'll do it. So that was kind of my mentality. So all of a sudden, the director of testing opened up because my boss was going to the Naval Academy, and I said, you know what, I'll do it. I don't get any more pay, it's going to be more of a headache, but the beauty of it is, is that I get to supervise. One of the things that, as you get into the workforce, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll realize that the people that have the highest amount of salaries, the people with the most responsibilities, they're obviously the ones that are, that are doing the, the, making the most money. And it's kind of the same in higher education. If you want to make money, if you want to go somewhere, you have to supervise, you have to be an administrator, and you have to be a manager. There's a reason why the head coach at Texas makes $4 million, but the OC doesn't make that much money. He's not managing the amount of people. So I took, the, took over as the testing director for a couple of years. Then eventually, the, my title, basically Director of Continuing Education Services, opened up, um, also known as Camps and Conferences. The guy before me took a job at Madison, and he's now running Badger Camps, and technically he's part of the athletic department. He's, I think his official title is a junior athletic director. But his, over, his oversight is, is Badger Camps. So he reports to basically all the, I wouldn't say the head coach, more like the assistant coaches. Who's heard of Greg Gard? Greg Gard handles all of Bull Ryan's basketball camps. Bull Ryan doesn't do a lot with basketball camps. Greg Gard basically gets the marketing, gets the advertising, tells my, the, the guy that was in my position before me what to do. So now we're at where I'm at here camps and conferences. Joe said, what do we do? I think he said that. We oversee all of the athletic camps, all the music camps, all the arts camps, and all the conferences that take place. Um, a lot of you are probably going to be into rec, rec sports. Last year we ran the Wisconsin Rec Sports Association State Conference. We had about 300 people come. That's what we do. We handle registration. We handle money. Basically, we're a centralized location, so if you want to run a Milwaukee Brewers or a Brewers baseball camp, all you have to do is go to me, we'll create a registration, we'll handle the finances, we'll do all the hiring, we'll handle all that stuff for you. Um, one of the pieces that people a lot of forget with camps is the legal issues. Who remembers Jerry Sandusky? Hopefully everybody's heard of it, it's not that long ago. After all that went down, every single person that steps foot on this, con on this campus to work a summer camp with a youth under 18, they have to sign a contract. So if you think about it, we hire, last summer we hired 865 employees to work our summer camps. We had roughly 8,000 people come to our, our Warhawk camps. That's a lot of paperwork, that's a lot of work just in general, and I hate to say it, but a lot of it's because of Sandusky and some of the other child abuse stuff that took down over the last five years. So our office handles all the uh, all of the logistics of getting the kids to the camper. What I tell the camp directors is that our goal is to make sure that when you report to camp, so when Joe and Carrie have women's basketball camp, all they got to do is instruct. They don't have to worry about does uh, you know Jane or Bill not have their paperwork. <coughs> They don't have to worry about is this guy registered, did he pay? Um, do, do we have insurance? That's a big one. We handle all that stuff. So that's our goal is we want to make sure that when they come to camp, all the camp director has to worry about is strictly the instructional, telling their, their uh, workers that they hire basically what to do, and we'll handle the rest. So that's more or less what, what my office does. Um, seasonal. The hardest part of my job is we're summer camps. So when are we, when are we busy? In the summer. And personally, my wife's an educator. She teaches third grade. We have two kids, one on the way, and our schedules are completely messed up. Right now, I can probably take a week off and we're okay. She can't. In the summer, she can take two months off. I can take maybe half a day off because we're so busy. So that's probably the worst part about my job. And I never really, I didn't realize that going in because I started in January. So I think this is great, it's kind of slow. Not so much. You know, then I tell my wife that I can't take off for three months in the summer. She's not too happy about it, but that's probably the, the worst part. Um, one of the beauties of, of what I do is that I'm still involved with athletics. 
one of the things that I that I said before was I wanted to be a college coach, then I moved to kind of wanting to be in higher education, and I still want to do both of those, and I am doing both of those kind of, but I don't really want to put in the coaches' hours. Again, if some of you are, are current athletes here, or if you have friends that are current athletes here, you spend so much time away from your family, away from home. When you're 18 to 23, that's the best. All you want to do is live in the gym. All I want to do is live in the baseball field. But once you start having a family and kind of settling down and having children, that kind of skews that a little bit. You don't want to spend every waking hour in the dugout. You actually kind of want to be home and, and with your family. So I, I do kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, I'm extremely co close with all the head coaches. Um, I have a lot of respect for them. I, I hope they have a lot of respect for me. They haven't told me otherwise. Um, I think we're all vying for the, for the, for the right purpose, the right cause. Um, Summer camps is a lucrative business here. Last year we took in $3.1 million. So a lot of that, about 90% of that is going to go to the coaches, the camp directors, to the programs. So if you ever look at, if you ever go to the football stadium and watch a football game, they got about 15, 20 coaches. A lot of those coaches are funded through their camp operation. Um, my, the guy that I took over for at, at, for Badger camps, he was telling me, their running backs coach has supplemented $85,000 a year from their camps. So a lot of these programs, and especially as you guys have probably heard, the state budget is, we're kind of screwed here as higher education. These coaches got to find money somewhere. You can only tap into the, to the donors at a small school like Whitewater so many times. The Catchels can only go donate so much money. There's got to be other fundraisers that they can have in order to make some money, to, whether it's refurbishing their football pads. Um, having, you know, assistant coaches, whatever it is. You've got to find that supplemental income somehow. And especially at a school like Whitewater, that's going to be basically through your summer camps. Um, there's a couple raffle auctions, there's a couple other things, but nothing's going to make the money as quickly and as easily and hopefully as painlessly as, as working some of the summer camps. So that's kind of our relationship with athletics. Um, I'll go back to my the calendar a little bit. Because we do a lot of conferences, once we start the academic year, like right now we're planning for some of our spring conferences, once the spring conferences get over, then we're kind of full steam ahead for summer camps. And right around October, August 20th is when we really close our books on summer. That's when we do all the reconciliation for, uh, for our camp accounts. We figure out that you know all the people were paid on the appropriate account, insurance is paid, background checks were paid, all that stuff. We have a little administrative fee that we cover to help with my staff. Um, that's right around August 20th, like I said. So ideally, before the fall starts, the coaches will know just about where they're at so they know what they can spend, what they have. And one of the biggest problems with Whitewater is that we keep, up, keep on winning. So the further you go, the more money you spend. And that's a good problem to have. If you're at Carroll, that's good. Your football team's probably done around November 15, you don't have to pay for postseason, all that jazz. But all of our programs are winning, so of course the more you win, the more you spend. Um, if you have a 40-man roster for baseball, but you have five people that you want to take along, well, you're paying for those five. The NCAA is not paying for that. So that's another reason with our camps. It's a more of a motivation to uh, you know, get more kids in, bring kids in. Some of the coaches will have a kind of a... I don't want to say a stipend, but a reward. If you get 35 kids to come in from a certain school and they all say your name, maybe the coach will get a couple hundred bucks for doing that. Um, some of the other coaches will say each player has to get 10 kids to come to camp, and that's their fundraising for the year, and they get whatever their player's package is with shoes and a t-shirt and shorts, something like that. So it is a pretty lucrative business. Um, I tell a lot of people that we are... Our office is probably as closely related to the private sector. We're strictly revenue generated. None of your tuition dollars, none of the tax dollars are, are used on our stuff. When Joe and Carrie run a basketball camp, everything they receive, it's all from the players. It's all revenue. So when the, just like all of you, you have a budget. Let's say your budget is $500 for the month of August or October. You move into that, you go under that 500, you go over that 500, you're spending credit cards, you're doing that kind of stuff. So each year, they'll know exactly how much they have to spend, and a lot of that's just dependent upon their numbers. So it is, uh, it's 
definitely a revenue generated, revenue producing office, and it's kind of cool. It's you can say you're with the sharks. I mean, you're always looking for the next big thing that's going to get kids to come to campus. Um, a lot of our, I tell our camp directors there's three reasons to run a camp. One is to get kids to campus. Um, we're not Wisconsin. We're not Madison. We don't have those one-day tryouts where some kid from Cleveland, Ohio is going to hit every Big Ten school for a one-day workout. Very few, very few of our sports actually recruit or have any recruits at our camps. A lot of it is from the smaller towns, whether it's Milton for Atkins and Jefferson, Northern Illinois, Janesville, some Madison, some Milwaukee. So our camps are not necessarily a recruiting tool. It's a recruiting tool to get kids to come to our school so maybe when they're 18 they say, shoot, I like that, I like White Walk. I had a great experience at piano camp, or I had a great experience at basketball camp, whatever it is. So that's one reason, to get kids to come to camp. The second reason, like I said before, make, make money for your program. With the state budget the way it is right now, Coach Bullis isn't, isn't going to get another $25,000 to help refurbish football pads or clean up his helmets. That's what it is. It's not going up. If anything, it's going to go down. And the last thing is to make money for yourself and then your fellow coaches. So those are the three reasons that I tell a lot of our camp directors to run camps. And you'll see the beauty of it is you get direct feedback. Whatever's in your bank account, if they have a good experience, you get some of these kids that come back when they're 18, all that is, is reason enough to, uh, to run a camp. So let's see what else did Joe... Uh... <laughs> And the last one that Joe really talked about was just kind of the, the aspirations to move forward and, and what are plans. The one thing that's beautiful about education is that nobody can take it away from you. Once you guys graduate from Whitewater, you're going to have a bachelor's degree. Nobody can ever say, you know what, you were cheated in sophomore year in English, you're out. i got to take that back. It's yours. It's gone. So people say, like, what should I do? Well, further your education. They can't take that away from you. So like I said, I got my bachelor's here, I got my master's here. For somebody looking to, to get in some sort of administration and higher education, you have to get a PhD or an EDD. So I think that's probably my goal for the next five years, to get some sort of PhD and move into some sort of administrative role, whether it's within athletics or another part of campus. Um, that's, again, with higher education, Dr. Copper, Dr. Telfer, Dr. Stone, all the big wigs that are you know, up on the hill Amy doesn't have a PhD, but you know, out of all the other athletic directors in Division Three, there's going to be a lot of them, probably a majority of them, that do have a PhD. And I'm not saying a PhD means that you're going to be a better administrator, you're going to be better at your job, but a lot of the jobs that I will be applying for are going to be requiring a terminal degree. So I encourage you, if you ever are looking to get into to higher education, go get your master's right away, and then before you're 40, try to get some sort of uh, EDD or PhD, if that's what you're, you're looking for. Um, how many of you like college? <clears throat> All of you, hopefully? It's a great place to work. So when you are thinking about your career, aspirations, where you want to work, what you want to do, working in higher education is extremely rewarding. You're, not ne you're really never going to get extremely rich, but it's a, it's a really fun atmosphere. Um, and I think that's I have my elementary degree to fall back on, and will I fall back on it someday? Uh, I don't know, probably not. You know, would I rather deal with 18 to 23 year olds than 10 to 12 year olds? Yeah, you guys are a little more fun. You can actually talk. You have a conversation, you know, when you're staying awake in class for the most part. But, you know, like I said, I encourage you, if there's ever some sort of position that you maybe like, you thought about, look <coughs> into it. Because like I said, higher education, whatever you thought you were going into, you're probably going to go into something else. When I was 18 to 22, if somebody said, you know what, you're going to be director of continuing education, I would say, yeah, bullshit. No way. Well, here I am. How did I get here? I don't know. I said yes to a lot of people, I guess. You know, and hopefully when you move forward, you'll kind of have that opportunity where you will have opportunities. Your boss will say, do you want to take over this? Yes. You want to take over this? Yes. Will you move to West Virginia? Yes, with hesitations. So hopefully, you know, once you guys get out of here and you graduate, whatever field you go into, you'll have some of those opportunities and you'll say yes to all of them. Because realistically, if you say yes, they're going to look back at you and say, yeah, he was good. You know, we're going to reward him if something comes up 
back in the Midwest. We're going to reward him if there's another job opening up, you know, maybe in the field that you really want to get into. So, um, you know, encourage, don't lose sight of what you want to do. You know, I think athletics are a big part. A lot of people want to be involved with athletics. When I was in the advising center, I told people, don't forget that athletics and leisure is everywhere. Whether it's selling baseball gloves for Wilson because a salesman, or, you know, working ticket office for the Brewers. You know, you forget that athletics isn't just, you know, the nine guys in the field and the four coaches. It's everything that goes into athletics and leisure and all that stuff. So, again, I encourage you to not lose sight of what you really want to do. Because the worst thing you want to do is get stuck in a position that you don't like, in a field you don't like, and you get in a rut and you're kind of stuck there. So that's kind of about me, I guess. That's my story. Any questions? <coughs> Anything? Joe just take off and that's what he does? Or... <laughs> All right. Um, can you guys just get out of here? What's, what's the... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Any questions at all? Anything at all? What position did you play? Pitcher. I was left hand, so I had a little bit of step above everybody else. The goofy righties. <laughs> Anybody else? Going once. All right. That's all I got. Quick one.